Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Oh no, that was last Sunday. Ah, if only it could be Father's Day again. I have to wait till next year. <laughs> Welcome uh, to Memorial Baptist Church. John Curler leading service this morning. So glad that you've joined us for worship and for study of God's word and to fellowship here together. No special announcements I'm aware of, but um, just there is prayer this afternoon at 4 p.m. and again next Sunday afternoon. And that lasts about 45 minutes, just general prayer for need to the church or things that you want to gather together to have people pray with you about. Um, so please, if you're available and would like to join us, that would be awesome. And this morning, uh, if I'm correct, we had a uh, new Bible study start at 8.30, this, and so that'll be continuing. So come early and uh, get some Bible study time there, and then stay for the time of worship and fellowship. Um, that's all I have for announcements. Let's worship. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are so grateful to be here, to be in your house on this Sunday, to have the sun shining and to hear the birds. Lord, we thank you for what it takes to move, to get here, all the things that you've allowed us to go through week to week, Sunday to Sunday. And Lord, as we open up a time of worship, intentional worship, allow us to be focused on you, mind, body, and soul, to hear you, to be moved by you, to be convicted by you, Lord. Allow your Holy Spirit just to move about this space, we pray. Amen. I encourage you to open your hymnals to number 26 and just follow the words of a mighty fortress is our God as I play the prelude, which is based on this tune. Well known by many Protestants as kind of the all-powerful song written by Martin Luther part of the Reformation, and yet the power came from a time of weakness. He was not feeling well, perhaps coming down um, as sickness. It was part of the 30 years tr that went on and on and on, the plagues in Germany. Um, writing from a time of need, and yet knowing God is our fortress, is our strength. So I encourage us prayerfully just to consider the words of this hymn as I play the prelude, which is kind of majestic sounding, um, and uh, then as we go through the call to worship and then ultimately sing this as the first hymn.
need to switch that over. Now we're ready. <laughs> Please rise for our call to worship. Our hope is in God alone. We wait in silence for him. He is our God and our salvation. We will not be shaken. Our God sends deliverance and honor. Like a mighty God, God is our enemy. Trust in God always, for God is power and grace. Brothers and sisters, praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Now let's join our voices singing hymn number 26, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
fine voice. Praise the Lord. Reading from Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. You know my folly, O God. My guilt is not hidden from you. I pray to you, O Lord, in the time of your favor. In your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me, from the deep waters.
answer me, O Lord, out of your goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me hopeless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. I am in pain and distress. May your salvation, O oh God, protect me. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him in thanksgiving. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people.
join together in prayer. Oh Lord, a mighty fortress are you. We are just frail beings, Lord. And we need you every hour, every moment, Lord. We need your care and your protection. We need your strength, your love and your joy. Lord, accept us now as we are, for we're gathered in your name to offer these praises, to offer ourselves, to offer all that you have given to us. Lord, abound here with us now. May we open our hearts and minds for what you have for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I'll ask the ushers to come forward to receive the morning's tithes and offerings. Giving back just a portion of what God has asked us to out of the abundance that he blesses us with. So the ushers will wait on you.
Good morning. Over the last two years, approximately, the Board of Deacons has been meeting, praying, and working on a draft of a discipline policy for the church. Last year's board worked on the initial framework during a retreat in October of 2015, and the current board took those notes and crafted a policy that we think gives us a good guide to work with. I'm not here today to talk about the content of the policy, but just to let you know that we have a proposed draft written up. That is going to be emailed out in a PDF form to all members this, this week. And there will be hard copies at the end of uh, next week's service for you to pick up if you prefer. So that what I urge you to do is read very carefully this policy. And it's, it's important that you read it because we'll be discussing it at the, Ju the July 31st quarterly meeting. So we want your voice to be heard before anything is adopted. But please don't get hung up on the word discipline because the very first point in the policy states the goal is reconciliation. We look forward to your input. you have something you want to share or a prayer concern, John will be around with the microphone. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll spend some time standing up and greeting one another this morning. Get out of your seat and seek somebody out you don't know.
A reading from Acts 7, verses 51 through 60. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through the angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see, the heaven, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at his right hand. At this they covered their ears and ye yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. The word of God for the people of God. So a little uh, clarification and greeting. When I say that you need to seek someone who's new, that doesn't mean that's the only person that you have to see. It just means don't talk just to people we know. So, clarification, in case we were. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, we've been in a sermon series on evangelism, very specifically looking through the book of Acts, and talking about what it means to tell our story. What it means to tell our story in the context of the big story of Jesus Christ. And today, talking about our story, we're going to look at what it means to live out the otherness of Jesus Christ. Let me first unpack what I mean by this otherness. From the book Slow Church, Smith and Pattison, and their chapter on hospitality, showcased the differences between the Israelites and the Christians. And they said what separated out the Israelites first and then the Christians was this otherness that was rooted first in Israel, then in Christ, and in Christians to follow, which is really rooted in the hospitality of God. God is constantly, through the Old Testament and the New Testament, telling us to reach out to the stranger, reach out to people around us, to be different, and to be set apart. But it's more than that, they say. In fact, this difference, some of which I chronicled a couple weeks ago, talking about the first church's difference in reaction, to the world around them, to Roman society, things like they were loose with their money and tight with their sexuality, it caused people to look at them and say, wait a minute, what is it about this group that's different? By 362 AD, Emperor Julian looks around and says, wait a minute, what is different about this group? Emperor Julian was trying to revive um, the Hellenistic faith and Roman values, so he looks at this group he calls atheists, they're Christians by the way, he calls them atheists, and he says to his high priest, and I'm going to paraphrase here, he says, what is it about them that we have failed to notice? Their regard for strangers, their care for the graves of the dead, they're going out with complete, profound holiness. That's what's gotten people's attention and turned them to us. And he goes on to say, hey, look, it is abomination that there is no Jew who has to beg anymore, that these impedious little Galileans, Christians, not only take care of their poor, but they take care of our poor. And then he says to the high priest, um, we don't even help our poor, but they help them. What is it about them that stands out? The actions of the first church, the actions of the disciples and the apostles garnered difference. That's this otherness. When we tell our stories, we are supposed to be different. This otherness of Jesus Christ is part of who we are. It means that what we say, what we value, what motivates us, what directs us, is not going to be the things of this world. It means that we're supposed to be kinder, we're supposed to be more gentle, we're supposed to think about other people's needs before our own more often than not. All of that's great. But in the great Ginsu knife description of otherness, there's more. And it's the more that I don't like. In being other, this otherness of Jesus Christ, 
It's not just encompasses how we treat others. It encompasses what we do and in reaction to pain and death and suffering. This otherness also means that we as Christians will not win more often than not. It means that we will most likely not live more often than not. It means that it is not a matter of if we face pain, suffering, and death. It is a matter of when we face pain, suffering, and death. And we are to react to the world with that differently. It's this otherness that allows Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to go be handed over to die for our sins and be raised. That is part of our story. And that's that otherness that I don't like. Hey, look, I don't mind singing those songs, Blessed Be Your Name, that when the darkness comes, I'll still say, Blessed Be Your Name. I have no problem singing that. But living that out and what that really means as otherness is profoundly terrifying to me. That's the part I don't like. Around Easter, I started telling you about a blog that I had been following, a couple by the name of Joey and Rory Feek. Joey died March 4th, 2016. She died of ovarian cancer. And the blog was, among other things, the chronicle of her death by her husband, Rory Feek. I honestly cannot think of a better description in modern terms of what it means to have this otherness, particularly in sacrifice and death and pain and suffering, than in the life of Joey Feek. She literally took a situation that the world said was over and ridiculous and it meant that God didn't intervene and she flipped the script. She flipped the script and she was able to praise God up until her death. She didn't die bravely. She died praising God. It was huge for me. I never had heard of her before I started reading that blog leading up to her death. Never heard her music. But I can tell you that that has changed my life. And I kept reading this blog because what was so amazing to me for those three months leading up to it that I read it and then the three months since her death is the same thing that amazes me now and that is millions and millions of people had their world changed because of her death. Not just because of their, her life, but because of how she died and what she did in the process. People came to know Jesus because of it. People became better parents because of it. People were changed because of her death. And recently, her husband, Rory, has put together a documentary that will come out in September. And the documentary chronicles this footage of about two years of time between January 2014 and March of 2016 when she died. Here's the amazing part. God had said to Rory and Joey, hey, look, I want you to quit music. Hide of your career. Stop singing. Stop what you're doing. Stop traveling. And I want you to film your ordinary life. That's the blog post called One Man's Ordinary Life. And he said, we had no idea why God was asking us to do it, but we did it. And the very first clip they filmed was Joey and Rory walking towards the cemetery on their property. She's pregnant with Indiana. She's about to give birth. And he says later, I have no idea why we walked in that direction, but God knew. Because that's the cemetery she's buried in where the story will end. But here's another amazing thing. Rory says in this footage... He says, look, God could have chosen to end this story any way he wanted to. He could have had a miracle, and everybody would have been praising his name, and everybody would have been testifying to the glory of God, but he didn't do it. He chose another way. That is the otherness of God. And the otherness of God means that as we stand in the otherness of Christ, there's all kinds of things that we will not understand. We have the choice to either rally against it or to be part of it in the otherness that separates us. Look, you can't read her blog post, you can't look at that footage and not realize that her life mattered and her death mattered. I think most people kind of a slam dunk to assume that most of us, not all, but most of us would say we think that all life matters. But very, very few of us would actually agree that death can matter. Death repulses us in our society, and maybe it should. But the problem with it repulsing us and the problem with us not being able to see that it can ever matter is when we face situations like Orlando a couple of weeks ago, we don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with it. 
And so all of a sudden, in order to make sense out of the senseless, what do we do? We start to make edicts and decrees and commentary and conjecture. It must have been because they were Muslim or homosexual or gun control because we don't know what to do with death. There is no redemptive value in our culture to pain and suffering. But here's the problem with that. Scripture says something entirely different. Scripture says that God can take the end of the story and make it the beginning with Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us that God can take what we think is useless and trite and redeem it. Scripture tells us that God can take people who we think are so far gone, they can never make it right again, and God can use them to push forth the gospel. God can do that because in the otherness of God, death can matter. And you see that in Stephen. Look at our passage with me this morning. And let's look at this otherness. Stephen ends up in front of the Sanhedrin because he is in trouble. He's in trouble because the Holy Spirit's moving among the disciples and the apostles, and it is growing. And in this growth, all of a sudden, the religious leaders look at this little band of followers, and it's growing, and it's thriving, and they're healing, and they're giving to the poor, and they're adopting babies that the Romans are casting off as useless. And the officials say, we don't know what's going on. There had never been a time in history when a would-be Messiah had been crucified or killed and the band of followers still held on. Never happened. Simon Bar Kokhba, he gets killed. Nobody's still preaching his name afterwards. Or Judas Maccabee, when the end of the Hundred Year Revolt is done and they're no longer in power, they close up shop. Nobody is going and proclaiming that they are behaving and acting in the way of Judas Maccabee. This is unheard of. And so the Sanhedrin don't understand what's going on. They think they killed that problem with Jesus. So Stephen ends up in front of them, and he has to defend himself against blasphemy, blasphemy against Moses and against God. And he knows that they have the power to take his life in doing so. And as he defends not himself, but the gospel, he gives one of the most profound, eloquent, beautiful sermons in all of scripture. And he lays it in them. You heard Jake read part of it. You stiff-necked people. You uncircumcised heart and soul. You know what stiff neck means? It means, look, you're not going to change. You're not going to look in any other direction than what you think you know is right. And so he lays them on him, and it ends in his death. Acts tells us that this is just not the prototypical martyr in Stephen. This is not some rogue preacher or proclaimer of the gospel. This is somebody who is entirely different because this is somebody that Scripture tells us in Acts chapter 7 is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's existing with the Holy Spirit. That means that it is, it is in him. It's breathing. It's moving. The Holy Spirit is taking over. And Stephen is embodied with this. And Stephen, as a result of the power of the Holy Spirit, is able to point people to Christ in how he dies and what he says leading up to it. And there's this beautiful parallel between how Jesus dies and how Stephen dies. Not because Stephen is Jesus, not because Stephen is a new Messiah, but because G Stephen, as emulating this otherness of Jesus Christ, he's able to die faithfully, he's able to pray for the people killing him as he's dying, just like Jesus says. I don't know any more other than that, than when you can pray for people who are killing you as you die. And he does not stop bearing witness, even till his dying breath. That's amazing. But you get to this point at the end of chapter 7, and you go, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? This is a sharp departure. I told you a few weeks ago, Ananias and Sapphira were a sharp departure. This is a sharp departure, meaning this stuff just got real. You could be killed for this stuff. I mean, it's one thing to have the otherness, giving to the poor, and being nice, and, and taking care of people. It's another thing to realize that otherness means death, sacrifice, pain, and suffering. And when you get to the end of chapter 7, you don't know what to do. And if you're anything like the people in chapter 8, what do they do? They take off. This otherness scares them just as much as it scares me, and they flee. The disciples and the apostles beat feet so, because they don't want to stick around for this stuff. But what do you do with this at the end of chapter 7? Because here's the thing. If you focus too much on Stephen being this cherub-like, loving, humble, righteous martyr, then you miss the fact that there is a strong violence in this passage. Where a man is having his skull crushed one hurled rock at a time. 
And if you, if you elevate the martyrdom to make it an idol, then what you do is you reduce all otherness to nothing more than inconsequential stuff in light of martyrdom. And then there's this roving commentary that you can easily come up against, and that is when the Holy Spirit moves about a group of people and you give your life to the Holy Spirit in willingness and they get to take over, then all of a sudden you get persecuted and people come after you. And when you realize when you hit the end of chapter 7 is that this kind of otherness means standing up for Christ, telling the truth at all costs, and laying every single thing on the line, including our lives. But here's the thing. The guys who kill Stephen, they're not the local hooligans in town. They're not even the Roman soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross. The guys who kill Stephen, they're the religious leaders of the day. They're the best and the brightest. They're the most influential in politics and in religion. And so when you get to this, these synagogue leaders, these priests, the Sanhedrin, the lawyers, the rich, the wealthy, they're killing Stephen. And when you get to this, you automatically think, oh my goodness, what kind of people do this? I mean, sure, Stephen lays it on the line to them, and he, he tells them not only are you sticknick people, but you butchered the gospel. But on what planet is stoning ever an acceptable way to deal with somebody? See, that's the thing about this passage. You can't escape it in our story. Sure, you can say to yourself, this is a narrative, don't make it more than that, Stephanie. That's just one thing in a long list of all the stuff that happens in the Bible. But here's the thing. This isn't the only stoning in Scripture. Scripture doesn't let us disown the past in the story. It doesn't let us walk away from the brutality of what it means to be stoned. And the old canons aren't going to work either. We can't say Old Testament law, justice, violence, bad. New Testament grace, mercy, gentleness, Jesus, good. It doesn't work that way. Because the really hard truth when we look at this homiletically as a passage is that it speaks to each and every one of us of what exactly we want that otherness to be. Because I read a passage like this, I don't want the otherness to be sacrifice, death, and pain. I want the otherness to be power and control and vindication. I want the otherness to be able to look at passages like this and say that Christians finally are right and we're finally the majority and we finally get to be on top and we finally get to make the decisions in life. You look at a passage like this and it becomes so close to violence that you have to question how much of that story of the cross in an empty tomb really lives inside of us. And you know what also complicates those questions? is that we live in a world where we are so out of touch with the world of the New Testament. We think we're persecuted because we're uncomfortable talking about Christ at work. You were killed in the New Testament if you declared publicly that you followed Jesus. When the vast majority of Christians in America are middle class and wealthy and prosperous, and they're the ones making the determination of what Christianity should be, when we are finally confronted with the raw, messy ugliness of otherness, we don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with getting sued or standing up for beliefs or for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, which brings us back to Stephen as more than just a story in a collection of stories. Look at the otherness of Stephen. First thing that Stephen does is he lets in this otherness God write his story. When we accept the otherness of Jesus Christ, when we accept the otherness of God, when we say we're going to live our lives for you, then we allow ourselves to be putty in the hands of God. We allow ourselves to have God write our story, no matter what that is. A few chapters before this, Stephen had been elevated to the role of a deacon. It's a great role. It's humble. It's prestigious. It means you wait tables. Really. That's it. I mean, it's all about the care and behind the scenes, and it's the nitty-gritty work of the church. It's not the proclaimer of the gospel. It's not the preaching and the teaching. You leave that to the big guys, and the deacons stay by and take care of stuff. But isn't it interesting that Stephen, a deacon, ends up in front of the Sanhedrin giving one of the most powerful sermons of all time? That's because God can write the script. What we do in church work is we carve out these little parts, and we say, this is my role, but the role of an evangelist, let's leave that to them. You know, we all love to read Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but none of us wants his life. None of us wants to have to stand up and did what he did. 
That's a motivational book we can write when, again, we got to get the courage to talk to our best friend about Jesus. But we don't want to be him. And yet scripture says, every single one of us, with every single thing that we have, are supposed to proclaim the gospel. That means Christianity gets to be a performance art. Not a performance, and not even art. But it means that every single thing, your good, your bad, your ugly, your traits, your skills, your spiritual gifts, the brokenness in you, the sins, the mistakes, the pain and the suffering, all of that gets to be used for God, for his glory, if you let it. And Stephen let him. Stephen said, God, whatever you want, I'll do. And so Stephen let him use his life in all of its glory, even in the pain, even in the suffering, and even in the death. Again, that scares me to death. It absolutely terrifies me. I mean, if I put my truth cap on, I'm fine with looking back at my life in hindsight and saying, God, those bad things, that's great. You used them for your glory, but I don't want to know about the bad things ahead of time. I don't want to ascribe to that. And then I have a friend who's been recently saying to me, I just want to be in the will of God. I just want to be in the will of God. If you're in the will of God, you say to God, you get to write my story. No matter where it goes, no matter what it does. Also notice that, that Stephen tells the truth. He tells the truth. He tells the truth at any cost. That is a tiny little statement that has huge implications. The truth in our culture is as pliable and movable and stretchable as silly putty, right? The truth in our culture gets you, and I'm not talking the little truth, I'm talking the truth with a capital T, like the number one killer in America is not heart disease, it's abortion kind of truth. That truth gets you polarized and put into a corner and labeled judgmental. That kind of truth he wasn't scared to say. It is mind-blowing that he ends up in front of the Sanhedrin on charges of blasphemy. Can you even imagine that for Stephen? Blasphemy against God. And he doesn't stand up there in front of these guys that he knows has the power to take his life and defend his life. He doesn't defend like Aristotle or Socrates. You know what he does? He says, look, you guys butchered the gospel, and here's how. God sent prophets to tell you about the Messiah, and you rejected them, and then you killed them. And then Jesus Christ came, and guess what? The blood of him is on you. And this idea that you're trying to contain God and the centrality of the temple in Jerusalem, it doesn't work. Because Jesus Christ now has blown that open. And how is the truth met? No one runs up and hugs him. They chase him out of town and they kill him. And no one intervenes. No one stops them. They watch him die. Am I willing to tell that kind of truth with those consequences? And not that the truth that, that leads to pain, suffering, and death, but how about the truth about my pain and my suffering? Do I tell the truth in my story, or do I edit my own sin out to tell others? Telling the truth at any cost. And then, the last thing you see with Stephen is the sacrifice. God allows Stephen to die. And he doesn't just allow it. He ordains it. He lets Stephen die. That is the part that is just so humbling. You know, I don't want to end up like Joey Feek. I don't want to die and leave my kids, even if it means that my death could matter. And I don't want to end up like Stephen, persecuted and killed. And so how do, you, how do you get to that point in your life? Are those people just really special people who have extraordinary strength and purpose in life? No, they're not any better or any different than us. You know the difference is? They have flipped that script. And you know what the script is? It says, I am not the story. Jesus is the story. The world tells you you're the story. Moralistic therapeutic deism has no part in the Bible. Stephen is able to go to his death praising Jesus Christ because he knows that he is a character in the story. He is not the main one. And that is offensive and shocking in a world that says it is all about you every single day. The only way you can accept that kind of sacrifice is if you realize that the whole reason we exist is to point people to Jesus Christ. Every aspect 
of our life and our death. That is the otherness of Christ. There's something that gets overlooked in this passage, and that is who else was in the crowd that day, right? He's sending off into a corner. It's Saul Paulos de Tarsus. Paul. Paul then, going by Saul, is over in a corner, and the coats are being dropped at his feet. And scholars have spent copious amount of time spilling ink, determining what that means. Does it mean that he was the leader? Does it mean that he's giving permission? Does it mean that he is part of it? Whatever it means, it means that he was there for the murder of Stephen. Paul. Paul, who will be a pivotal force in Christianity. Paul, who will die for the gospel, is there taking part in the murder of Stephen. How is that even possible to have that kind of transformation? It's possible through the plan of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how it's possible. In our last church, there were these two big stained glass windows right next to each other, and uh, one of them was Stephen. Now, the church had, I don't know, 30 large stained glass windows, so the people could have put them anywhere they wanted to, but Stephen was right over in the, in the one corner, and the Stephen window had in it of all the things that Stephen did, you know, him serving people as a deacon, but it showed his death right in the center. And in the center of this window is Stephen being crushed, one stone at a time, and in the corner is Paul with the coats around him. And I used to chuckle all the time because the person who put those windows in knew exactly what they were doing because you know the window they put next to it? Paul. So Paul's window with all the stuff that Paul did, you know, breaking free from jail, proclaiming the gospel, dying for Jesus, right next to it is the death of Stephen. He could never escape that from his story because that led him to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That was part of the thing. And if God can redeem that, I promise you God can redeem anything. We're going to sing it as well with my soul in just a minute. And I'm sure you all probably know the story of it is well with my soul. I grew up hearing that song in church. I probably heard it, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, 30, I, who knows how many times from a little girl on. But when I was 14 years old, I heard the story behind it for the first time. Um, I was in a small little church outside of Philly. My dad wasn't pastoring the church. He was there visiting his friend who was preaching and he came with light cap. And um, the pastor, Ken, started telling the story. Horatio Spafford is the one who writes the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. 1871, Horatio and his wife live in Chicago. They are very wealthy. He's a prosperous attorney. He is an elder in the Presbyterian church. He's a devout Christian. They have four daughters. Chicago fire strikes and it wipes out the city. They're spared, they're able to rebuild whatever income and situation that they have had, um, like most people, completely wiped out in that fire. Two years later, 1873, Horatio Spafford and his wife are invited to vacation in Europe. And so they um, make these plans to take their four daughters on the SS um, Ville de Havre. But last minute, Horatio has to stay back and work. The girls go on ahead with Anna, and on November 21st, 1873, a British ship rams the side of the Ville de Havre, and it sinks within minutes. Anna is found unconscious, floating on a spar in the water. But the four girls die or drown. So Horatio Spafford, as the story goes, not the legend, the story, is that he passes over that water because he has to get over to where Anna is in Europe. And so as he's passing over the very same water where his daughters drown, he approximates the location. He stands on the deck of that ship and he writes the words. When storm clouds like sea billows roll, it is well with my soul. And I'll never forget in that tiny little church, Ken Lightcap, the pastor saying that day, that if you have the ability to stand on the deck of that ship and write those words, then what you're saying is, I understand the life of a Christian is to a completely different way of life. It's a completely different way of life. It's when the world tells you that you have every single right to crumble and blame God for being in that location and what he took away from you. You don't. 
You have the peace that passes all understanding, and you're able to say, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well with my soul. It's the kind of, of otherness of Jesus Christ, understanding that we're different, that allows you to face death and praise God like Stephen or Joey Fink from the very beginning. And that, hearing that pastor talk that day about that was transformational for my life. Because the 14-year-old sitting there in that church, and then right after that, after Pastor Lightcap finished talking, this woman sang this, this uh, college student from UPenn. And it was like I, I heard the song for the first time being sung. But it was transformational because it was in that moment that you realize all this stuff isn't just stuff you have to get over. It's stuff that God can use for his glory. That's the otherness that we're to proclaim. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as we go into a time of silence, as we go into a time and a moment of worshiping you and, and hearing those words sung, Lord, oh, Father, just remind us on our worst days, not only that you walk beside us, but that you, that you can redeem and you can use. And God, give us the wisdom and the knowledge to know those things that are from you and those things that are not. And Help us to be able to have the courage to stand on the deck of a ship and sing those words one day, we pray. Amen. Please take your hymn books and open to 493. We'll stand and sing, It is well with my soul.
pray. Gracious Lord, we ask you to take us out into your world as imitators of you, as little Christ, we pray. Amen.